see, where am I right now? Well, I know that we're pursuing truth and beauty and goodness through great literature. So I must be at the Alyosha Society. Hey, welcome, friends. So good to see you back. Video number four out of six total on Martin Luther King Jr., two particular works, a letter and a speech. Letter from Birmingham Jail and his famous I Have a Dream speech. Let's get right to it. A lot to talk about. And here we go. There's our outline of videos. We're looking at the second half in this video, the second half of the letter. And then the next video, we have a I Have a Dream speech. I have a little surprise for you, a little surprise guest who's going to join us for a wonderful, fruitful, sightful discussion on race in America for the final video. So let's get right to it. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about civil disobedience, because that's really what's going on in this letter. That is what Martin Luther King Jr. is practicing, civil disobedience. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but civil disobedience is, and I, you know what, guys, I just went, I, I just went right to the source, okay? I went right to Merriam-Webster, and here is the official definition of civil disobedience, a refusal to obey governmental demands, so you willingly and openly refuse to obey a law or commands, especially as a nonviolent and usually collective. That just means you're not necessarily doing it on your own, although I, you could practice civil disobedience all by yourself. But a collective means you're doing it as a group, means of forcing concessions from the government. Forcing concessions mean you're forcing the government to change, to concede, to say, oh, Look at all these people protesting this law. Maybe we should reconsider. The government reconsiders and the government says, oh, we're going to change that law. So one more time, civil disobedience. I want you to know this definition. A refusal to obey governmental demands or commands, especially as a nonviolent and usually collective means of forcing concessions from the government. I want to get into some very notable examples in history. Oh boy, I don't know where I can put myself. All right, I'm putting myself over the word notable. All right, just so you know what that is. You won't be able to see that word. Notable examples, all these wonderful pictures on the left are examples of individuals who are famous, very well known for their particular expression of civil disobedient. So let's, uh, I, I think I put these in sort of chronologically. So let's take a look. Shipra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives. Remember this story in Exodus chapter one, where the Pharaoh commanded that all the Hebrew males who were born would be put to death, where the Pharaoh was afraid, oh my goodness, we got like you know a couple of million Hebrews living in Egypt now. They could rise up and they could you know take over. So the, the Pharaoh says to the, to the Hebrew midwives, when you're giving birth, when you're giving birth to a, if a, when a Hebrew woman is giving birth, if it's a girl, that's fine. Let her live. If it's a boy, put the boy to death. And these two women refused to obey that order. That is a, a kind of civil disobedience. Antigone, Antigone is a character from a play, specifically the, the play is named after her, Antigone, but it's a series, a, a trilogy of plays called the Theban Trilogy. Don't have time to go into all the details here, but you may be familiar with the Oedipus story. Remember the Oedipus story from your studies in ancient literature? He was the dude who was destined by the fates to kill his father and marry his mother. Yeah, actually, uh, we'll talk about that in another course. But in the play Antigone, Antigone's brother is killed in battle. And the authority, which is actually her uncle, Uncle Creon, 
refuses to allow Antigone to bury her brother, to give her brother the proper respect and dignity of a burial, and Antigone refuses. She refuses. That is civil disobedience. Hey, you've heard of Samuel Adams and the Boston Tea Party? That was more of a collective example. Uh, you know, the, the whole group, they dressed up in Native American garb, threw the tea in the harbor. You know the story, hopefully, of the Boston Tea Party. Harriet Tubman, that image in the upper right there is a picture of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was born into chattel slavery. She ended up escaping and then helping other people escape the horrors of slavery. But slavery was entirely legal at that time. So she was practicing civil disobedience. Good for her. Henry David Thoreau actually wrote this very famous essay I'm holding called Civil Disobedience. Now, in 1849, the 1840s, the United States was at war with Mexico over disputed territories, much of what is called Texas today. Henry David Thoreau believed that the United States government was wrong for being at war with Mexico and that all the government wanted to do was expand our territories in order to expand slavery. So he refused to pay a poll tax because he said, well, the poll tax is going to support the war effort and I'm not going to support it. And Thoreau was arrested and jailed for his civil disobedience. Gandhi, the Salt March of 1930, not a lot of detail here, but he was protesting, and this is another collective effort, but Gandhi's the leader of it, uh, protesting uh, British monopoly on uh, salt uh, trade. 1930, very famous. Got a picture of Gandhi there on the left-hand side. Now, you may not have heard the name Claudette Colvin. Well, Claudette Colvin was sort of what you might call the original Rosa Parks. She was a 15-year-old girl who refused to give up her seat on the bus, a black girl who refused to give up her seat during the Jim, this is Jim Crow era. This is before Rosa Parks. Civil disobedience. That's a picture of her down there next to Martin Luther King Jr., and then, of course, Rosa Parks, we, we know the story of Rosa Parks, who also refused to give up her seat on the bus. We are talking about Martin Luther King. Right smack dab in the middle there, it's a very controversial individual. He's uh, still alive. He lives in Moscow, Russia, because if he gets on a plane and sets foot on Russian, on Russian, on American soil, he would most likely be put on trial, and if found guilty, uh, well, let's just say things would not look good for him. What did Ed Snowden do? Well, around, oh boy, I'm going to say 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, around that time period, he was working for the National uh, Security Agency and the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Those are agencies of the government where you have very, very, very high levels of classified, you know, abilities to access classified information. Ed Snowden concluded that the United States government was using its power to uh, spy on not just the bad guys, but on even totally innocent people. He was a whistleblower. He went to the journalists in Hong and uh, well, he was in Hong Kong when he did this, blew the whole thing, just blew it out of the water. I believe uh, Obama was president during this time. And so he practiced civil disobedience in that he basically ratted out his own government for what he would have called inappropriate surveillance. So here you have a, a great list, guys. There are many, 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 many others, thousands of individuals and groups have practiced civil disobedience over the centuries. I wanted to just make a very short list 
of some of the most well-known ones. And they're fun to study. They really are because, you know, we all don't agree on whether or not that individual or that group had the right uh, to do that or whether it was uh, a moral good that that group or person chose to break that law. You know, some of these are, are very, very controversial. You know, you and I may even sit down and have a talk and we might not agree. Now, most of these, I think we would agree. I think we agree with Rosa Parks. We, we agree with Harriet Tubman. You know, we, we agree with the, the midwives. But when you look at every single case of civil disobedience, you're, you're not necessarily going to have a consensus. Uh, let's look at the uh, second half of the letter. All right, let, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, here are the questions that I want to take a look at. Now, the numbers up here, guys, well, where can I put myself? Boy, I am just having a hard time. Let me do this, and then I'll move. Um, I, I have a list of questions, but the page numbers, the numbers in the parentheses probably mean nothing to you. They just kind of clue me in as to where we are, because I seriously doubt if your version would have the same page numbers. But now we, we get back to Martin Luther King Jr. and his letter from Birmingham jail. So he is laying, remember in the previous video, we looked at the four steps that he talks about. Here are the four steps that anybody who wants to exercise civil disobedience should work out. In the very, very beginning of the letter, you may remember that he says, first of all, collect your facts. Second of all, try negotiation. Thirdly, you know, self-purification, you know, look in the mirror, examine yourself, make sure that you've got this whole thing right. And then, and only then, and also self-purification, be willing, decide right then that you're going to be willing to take the punishment for whatever, you know, it is. I mean, if the punishment for what you're doing is jail time, then you are, you're saying, I am willing to go to jail for this. And then finally, the fourth take direct action. So the first question you want to look at is, so how do you determine what makes a law unjust? Friends, that is the key question here, isn't it? Like who gets to decide that? What if I don't like the fact that the speed limit is 65 miles an hour? Okay. What if I don't like the fact that the city I live in says I can or can't park here or there? Is it just arbitrary? Mm, not according to Martin Luther King Jr. No, he says this. He actually lays out what I think is a pretty good argument. He says, first of all, he quotes St. Augustine and he says, an unjust law is no law at all. The question is, who gets to decide? What is the difference between the two, he says? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with, here it is, squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Now, when I think of moral law, when I think of the law of God, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Ten Commandments. You know, look at the Ten Commandments, because if you really think about it, if you really study the Ten Commandments in depth, they they really encompass everything. They, they encompass really all of life. I mean, I, I can't think of a sin that in one way or another does not fit into the Ten Categories laid out in the Ten Commandments. So look at the Ten Commandments. Can you Can you honestly say that this law is a violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Now he goes on. To put in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, remember he's the Roman Catholic theologian, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the British philosopher Martin Buber, 
substitutes an I slash it relationship for an I slash thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it's morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation, is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. And then I think this is important, the last part of this little section. Thus, it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court. Remember, we talked about that. That was Brown versus the Board of Education. It, it basically uh, was the law that, that made segregation of public schools illegal. He says, because that would be morally right. And I can urge them to disobey the segregation ordinances for they are morally wrong. So generally speaking, what I hear Martin Luther King saying here is there has to be a standard that is above all of us, that's outside of all of us. Okay, it can't be one of us. I can't do it. You can't do it. Some other really, really smart lady or man can't do it. It has to be the law of God to which we all appeal and say, well, here's what God's law says. So uh, to the extent that Martin Luther King Jr. is saying that the way we determine whether or not a law is just or unjust is through the law of God, to that extent, I would say, Amen. That's the standard that we'd want to look at. Now, what is key to breaking an unjust law? Wow. Now, if your parents ask you at dinner tonight, so what'd you learn in school today? And you say, well, we learned uh, what, what is key to breaking laws. Sorry. I mean, it is kind of what we're doing here. But the, the important thing is it's an unjust law. A couple of pages up. I'm starting with the paragraph that begins, I hope you are able to see the distinction. A couple lines down. One who breaks an unjust law. Now listen, this is really important to Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy. Must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. Openly, openly, lovingly, and take the penalty. This is not like some of the some of the uh, folks that we see today running around in in masks in some of our cities, smashing store windows, damaging cars, you know, at threatening people, doing all this damage and such. And they're doing it. They're not doing it openly. They're doing it in the in the dead of night. They're not doing it lovingly, and they're and they're concealing their identity, and they are not willing to take the penalty. So these protesters that behave that way are not acting in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They're simply not. I like what he lays out here. I submit that an individual who breaks the law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. So see, what Martin Luther King is saying here is you're not, you are breaking a law, but in a higher sense, you're showing the, the, the greatest regard for the concept of true law. Interesting concept. Third question we want to look at, second half of this letter, is breaking an unjust law optional? Oh, Mr. Etter, these are tough ones. These are tough questions. I mean, I, how do I how do I wrestle with that? He's making a video on it. Are you allowed to have that?
You mean to tell me that I have to make a decision? I can't, I can't see, uh, well, hold on, just time out. Let's just see what he says. A couple of pages up. Here's what he says. I'm going to be skipping around here. So you can try to catch up with me or pause the video if you, you know, if you can't find it where I am. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. So the answer to that question, according to Martin Luther King, is a resounding no. It's not an option. You know, a famous person or a, I, I don't even know, uh, I, I'm not sure if we know who said this, because this quote is often attributed to different individuals. So I don't know who said it first, but it doesn't really matter. And the quote goes something like this, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And that's essentially what Martin Luther King is saying. Uh, skip over about a page. I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of an extremist. And I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of these two opposing forces. And so he, he starts talking about the tension, the people that are, are sort of on his side in a lot of areas would disagree with him when it comes to this one, this question, because he's saying it's not an option. The right thing is to actually break an unjust law. Next page, I've tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need to emulate neither the do-nothingism of the complacent nor the hatred and despair. So he says, okay, there are people on one side that just throw up their hands and say, well, I don't agree with that law, and I think it's evil, and I think it's bad, but you know, my life's pretty comfortable. I'm not going to do anything to disrupt things. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who are so irate about that law that they, they go way too far and they practice violence. So Martin Luther King says there has to be this middle ground where we disobey the law, but we do it openly, lovingly, and willing to take the penalty. Wow, that's a pretty fascinating position of how he saw himself kind of squeezed in between these two extremes. Uh, and then he says this, what's going to happen to the people on this far extreme over here, the people who are so irate, they can't seem to control themselves and they just want to lash out in anger. He says, if these people over here don't stand up and do something and assist them, here's what happens. He says, if his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. So King sees himself squeezed in between these two extremes. If the people over here who were just saying, oh, I don't, I don't think that's a just law, but I'm not going to do anything about it, then these people over here. And I think that in, to some degree has happened in our country because we see a lot of these folks over here now. There, uh, there are there are a number of organizations who sanction violent protest, and their their goal is to do lots of damage. Is Martin Luther King right? Was he being prophetic? Sure does seem like it in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Next question. Well, that kind of brings us to the church. Where, where, where should Christians be in all of this? I'm um, skipping all the way up. I'm about three or four pages from the end of the letter. He says, 
But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, then it will lose its authenticity. It will forfeit the loyalty of millions and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. And we would, of course, say now, no meaning for the 21st century. And again, I do think to some extent that has happened, uh, where the church has kind of tried to just sort of look away, you know, in, in, in areas of social injustice. It has turned out that what, what that makes Christians then is what Martin Luther King would be saying is it would make Christians complicit in the injustice. And so then what does the world, the culture then looks at the church and says, you guys are just sort of like your own little, you know, your little uh, social club where you, you know, go and drink your lattes and sing your songs, but you don't have any real relevance for making change. That I think that's essentially what King is saying here. So what about the relationship between the desired goal which is social justice on the one hand and the means of reaching that goal. Again, I think we've said this. I think, you know, this is towards the end of the letter. And I do, I think this is a hallmark of Martin Luther King Jr.'s overall philosophy. It's a great quote. You know, this is one of those, you know, put it on a, you know, cross stitch it on a pillow, you know, stick it on the couch or frame it. Uh, he says, the means we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. So we are seeking, and no one would argue, well, at least the people who are generally on our side here, he says, no one would argue that we are fighting for a just cause. We're fighting for equality, equal treatment, equal pay, using the same water fountains and school buses and, and, and schools and so forth. No decent person is really going to argue with that. The argument comes in when we get into, well, how do we accomplish that? And King says, the means by which we do it has to be as pure as the actual goal that we're seeking. Remember, nonviolent protest, which is done openly, lovingly, ready to take the penalty. That's Martin Luther King's system. What's the bi biblical precedent for it? Now, he didn't lay this out at the end of his letter. I just don't think that was exactly what he was trying to accomplish here. I think it might have been helpful if he would have added that to the letter. But again, remember, he's writing to pastors. I don't know that he would have needed to do that. So I want to just comment on it. From a Christian perspective, what do we think about civil disobedience. Well, there's definitely biblical precedent. The, the, the question is not, is there biblical precedent? There's, there's plenty of biblical precedent. And if you're wondering what the fancy word precedent means, it just means uh, an example that we should follow, an example that we should follow that's happened. Okay, so I'll throw out what I think. I mean, we talked about the Hebrew midwives, but I, I'll, I'll throw out here what I think is probably the most well-known one other than the Hebrew midwives in the Bible is in Acts chapter five. So when the apostles were told, you shall not preach or teach in the name of Jesus anymore, you are commanded to stop. And this very, very famous retort in Acts chapter five, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So there you have it, guys. There is a very clear, clear biblical precedent. You know, if the government is forcing upon you an action, a law, whatever the case may be, that is clearly an ungodly, unbiblical law practice, whatever the case may be, then the precedent here is, you are actually honoring and dignifying the general concept of law 
and godliness more if you disobey that particular law, because you are actually obeying God rather than men. So there is biblical precedent. I hope this has been a helpful video, friends. I really do. I, I think that King, what he gives us in this letter is really sort of, okay, there it is. You know, this is, this is all of the, the stuff that we talk about when we talk about social justice and civil disobedience and what is the role of the church and all these things, it's not the end. Okay. The letter from Birmingham jail is not the end of the discussion. I think in some senses, it's what's it, it, the, the ideas in it help to spark healthy and hopefully fruitful discussion on this important issue. So this was video number four out of six total. In the next video, we're going to be taking a look at the I Have a Dream speech. Now, friends, you can read this speech, but don't, don't merely read the speech. Go to YouTube, look it up, find a video of the speech and watch the speech. It is truly, truly a remarkable thing to see when you, when you look at the actual event as Martin Luther King Jr. is standing there. I think I think we're told that something like a quarter of a million people, a quarter of a million people were gathered there as he, in 1963, when he gave this speech there at the Lincoln Memorial. So be sure you, you know, listen to the speech, read the speech, and then check out video number five. See you then, friends.